Last time we met, the bullet had started to fly in the American Civil War. We are uh, going to pick it up in 1863. And if you followed along with this last time, you know that if you had to gauge who was winning the war the previous year in 1862, probably would have given the edge to the South, to the Confederacy. And um, if you followed along, you'll know that you, you don't have to be a military scientist to understand this. What the South had that Abraham Lincoln and the North just simply did not was leadership. That is going to change here uh, in, in, our, in our lecture today. Before we go any further, I, I want to get something out of the way. It's a turning point in the war. It's a pol policy sort of transition. And a lot of it has to do with, with Abraham Lincoln's stance on slavery. Okay. In the beginning stages of 1863, um, Union military leadership begins to notice a trend um, emerging. The, the further that they penetrate into the Confederacy, the further they go into the South, the more runaway slaves they seem to pick up. Now, again, you don't have to be really, really smart to understand what's going on here. There's never been a better time to run away from your plantation in the midst of the Civil War. Um, and, and honestly, what better place to hide out than right behind the Union Army? Not only is it a bunch of guys that are fighting your enemies, right? people that are trying to keep slavery in place, but it's a bunch of guys with guns. right? So one of the safest places in the world is right there behind the Union Army. Well, the leadership begins to, to kick this up the chain of the command. And it, it, it arrives on Abraham Lincoln's desk. What Abraham Lincoln is going to do with this is ultimately turn emancipation into an instrument of war. Many of you have heard of the Emancipation Proclamation. What I want you to understand about this is that it's being used as an instrument to win the war. Here's how. What the Emancipation Proclamation does is it frees the slaves in the territories that are still presently at war with the country. So Alabama, Georgia, Virginia, yes. Most of Tennessee, Kentucky, New Orleans, no. It's important that you understand this doesn't happen everywhere, only the places that are still actively fighting the Civil War. It's designed to cause chaos, confusion, and disorder on the Confederate home front um, as, a, as, as a way to win the war, keep pressure on the Confederacy on, on all different levels, including the home front. It's important that you understand that part of the reason that 1863 is an important turning point is that emancipation, freeing the slaves, is going to be used as an instrument of war. Um, now, freeing the slaves is one thing. Um, allowing black men to fight, to enlist, and actually fight in the Civil War, that, that's something different altogether. Up and through 1863, um, Frederick Douglass, the renowned, famous abolitionist, um, and, and, and John Andrew, the, the abolitionist governor of Massachusetts, had been putting a lot of pressure on Abraham Lincoln to allow black men to do exactly that. In 1863, Lincoln could resist no more, and he finally commissioned the first all-black regiment. It'll come to be known as the 54th Massachusetts. This is a really, really important development. And the reason that Douglas and Andrew were pressing so hard for the allowing of black men to fight is because this would ultimately dispel a myth that had long been used to prop up the institution of slavery. Don't worry about it. African Americans don't feel pain the way that white people do. African Americans don't think the way that white people do. This had been a myth that was out there in American life that had been used to calm people down when it comes to the auction block. It had been used to dispel charges that the abolitionists were bringing when it comes to the evils of slavery. Don't worry about it. Well, if you enlist in the war, what that saying is, I understand that I might not come back. For those of you that have served in the military, you'll, you'll probably be the first ones to say joining any branch of the military is not an easy decision. It's not something that you do just kind of randomly. 
what it also means is these individuals know the risks that are involved. You might not come back. You might not come back in one piece. Um, and the reward of freedom and equality outweighs that risk. That's what's so significant about the 54th Massachusetts, that this is a war for equality. And black men understand that. Black women understand it, for that matter, as well. That the Civil War is emerging into a war for equality. Now, the going rate for an average infantryman in the Civil War was about $13 a month. That's what Lincoln's army would have been paid in 1863, $13 per month. The 54th Massachusetts was paid 10. And so if you're one of these infantrymen in the 54th Massachusetts and you're sitting around looking at the situation and you're thinking to yourself, you know, a black finger will pull a trigger the same way a white finger will, a black body will take a bullet the same way that a white body will, why is it that we're being paid $3 less per month? At this critical moment, the governor of Massachusetts jumps into the situation. He says, nobody worry, nobody, you know, uh, desert, no, nobody go home. I've got your extra $3, and I'll make sure that you get paid $13 a month. The state of Massachusetts will guarantee this. The men still refuse. What the men of the 54th Massachusetts do is they say, you either pay us $13 per month like you do everybody else, or pay us nothing at all. And in the end, it's going to be Lincoln that blinks. Lincoln would, would ultimately up his ante and meet the demand of $13 per month, which goes to further demonstrate the 54th Massachusetts. People understand that this is a war for equality. Equal pay for equal work. It's, it's all realms of the war is driving at the institution of equality in American life. The 54th Massachusetts doesn't have a particularly happy ending. Although the infantrymen themselves were black, the leadership of the 54th was white. The leadership is a Harvard graduate, a guy by the name of Robert Gould Shaw, who came from a very fiery abolitionist family in Boston and um, considered it to be a great honor to command um, this, this unit. And Gould Shaw is actually going to volunteer the 54th's services when it comes to the assault on Fort Wagner. Fort Wagner was a Confederate fortification in South Carolina that absolutely would not crack. Um, if you're looking at the PowerPoint slide on there with, with me, you can see that it's buttressed uh, by the sea. It's very difficult to have a frontal assault and the first units in, including the 54th Massachusetts, have basically signed up for a suicide mission. And not many of them come back. Gould Shaw himself was killed in battle. The Confederates won this battle, uh, the Battle of Fort Wagner. And in the aftermath, they, they, they dug these massive trench graves and they threw everybody, including Gould Shaw, in. And the 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 people of the Confederate variety considered this to be a very big slight, one of the ultimate insults in, in Southern life, um, figuring that his family would demand that his remains be dug up and be brought back up to Boston. But his family, keep in mind, very abolitionist-oriented family, um, thought that it was a great honor to have him buried there with his men, and certainly he would want to have been buried with his men, and that's where they left his body. But the 54th Massachusetts absolutely demonstrates that this is now full-scale war for equality. The other reason that 63 is such a big year is that Lincoln finally, finally gets some real tangible success on the battlefield. Keep in mind, that had been what was dogging him in 1861 and 1862. The battles of Vicksburg and Gettysburg are going to change that. Gettysburg is in the West. And if you followed along with us the last time, you know that the West is not going to make the headlines, but it's ultimately where the war is going to be won. Vicksburg is on the Mississippi River, the western edge of the state of Mississippi, about midway through the state. It's a very critical and very important juncture. It is a Union victory. That's important, and you should write that down. It's very clear-cut Union victory, but the results of the Battle of Vicksburg are infinitely more important than, than, than the victory itself.
Because what the fall of Vicksburg does, guys, is it cuts the Confederacy in two. The Union Army now controls the entirety of the Mississippi River. They control it from Tennessee southward into northwest Mississippi. Keep in mind that New Orleans fell very quickly in the struggle, so it's moving northward from New Orleans. And the final straw fell at the Battle of Vicksburg, and that cuts the Confederacy in two. What that means is that Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas, three very critical states to the Confederate efforts, they're no longer able to participate in this fight really big momentum changer. The even bigger momentum changer is the Battle of Gettysburg. Now once again, Gettysburg is not in the South. It's not Virginia. Gettysburg is located in southern Pennsylvania. And when the Confederate commander, Robert E. Lee, invaded, he's going on the offense. He's trying to win the war. Gettysburg much like Vicksburg, is going to be a very clear-cut Union victory, although it was a very costly victory. On day one, Robert E. Lee tried to flank his opponent, the Union general by the name of George Meade, M-E-A-D-E, -E, in case you care. It didn't work. Meade blocked it. So he tried a flanking maneuver from the other way. Meade blocked it again. So on day three, there's only one place left to go. That was straight up the middle. This doesn't go very well either. Meade blocks that again. And, 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 and Lee, the South, suffers heavy, heavy losses on that third day. Lincoln's orders were for Meade to chase Robert E. Lee, who's clearly, clearly wounded, his army, that is, very clearly wounded, chase him down and finish the fight. And Meade just stood there. Now, again, Gettysburg is very clearly a Union victory. It pushed Lee back into Virginia, and he would never invade the North again. The significance of Gettysburg is this, in, in one sense is that now the South is very clearly on the defensive. The North is on the offensive, and the best that the South can hope for is some sort of negotiated truce. Um, they're not going to be able to win the war, as in capturing Washington or crushing the Union Army. That ship has sailed. The other significance about the battles of Gettysburg is that it changes the nature and purpose of the war. In the aftermath of the battle, Lincoln will go and, and dedicate the battlegrounds as a national memorial through his Gettysburg Address. Many of you know how this speech starts out. Four score and seven years ago, he's talking about the revolutionary period. Our fathers embarked on this great experiment in democracy paraphrasing, of course, and now here we are in the middle of the Civil War seeing if this great experiment, this great nation can endure. And what he, what, he, what he calls for in the Gettysburg Address is a new birth of freedom. We need a new birth of freedom. The translation there, guys, is that slavery needs to end. We need to abolish it everywhere, not, not just limit where it can go. We need to abolish it in Georgia and in Virginia and in Arkansas and in Alabama. Slavery will be no more. Again, another very important reason why 1863 is so important, because now, through the Gettysburg Address, it's not just a war to preserve the Union, as it was in 1861 and 62. By 1863, this is now fully a war to preserve the Union as well as end the institution of slavery. What really is going to turn this around for Lincoln is going to be capable military leadership. Um, we've talked about the guy that you're looking at on the screen right there. That's U.S. Unconditional Surrender Grant. And Grant... Although a West Point graduate, he, he's not a genius. What he understands is he had a huge numerical advantage when it comes to troops. Um, he had a lot more troops than Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy did. And so what he did much better at was following Lincoln's orders. When Lincoln told him to go find the enemy and engage him directly, right? that's exactly what Grant did. And in the process, he got a lot of his guys killed. I mean, it was full frontal assault. He wasn't afraid to get in there and get his hands dirty. But what Grant is aiming for 
is to inflict heavy casualties on the Confederacy. Because, yeah, this is going to be a problem on his end. Nobody likes to get a lot of their guys killed. But it's going to be devastating from the Confederacy standpoint because they just simply cannot replace that kind of manpower the same way that the North can. So Grant does a lot better job of engaging the enemy, right, and, and fighting to conclusive ends. He gives as good as he gets. It, there's nothing scientific to it. It's more or less a war of attrition. The other guy that Lincoln's eventually going to get is a guy by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman, who understands this notion of a hard war. And as you're going to find out, this hard war is not necessarily on Confederate armies as much as it is on the Confederate citizenry. More of that in just a second. For right now, I need you to understand that 1864 is an election year. One thing before we get to the, the meat of this, the South is not voting in this one. Virginia, Arkansas, Alabama, they're not voting. Right? They left the Union, they don't get to vote in the election. Lincoln's election, even going into November, was not a slam dunk. What is going to prove to be so influential is success on the battlefield. When Grant and Lee take over in 1864, they begin to win significant battles. There are two battles that I need you to be mindful of in particular, because what they're going to do is they're going to send shockwaves of optimism all throughout the North, and voters are going to really demonstrate that optimism in, in Lincoln's leadership in the election. One would be the siege of Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital. Um, for weeks, Richmond had been holding out. It was surrounded by Union forces, and um, in October of 1864, it'll fall. And that is going to send just a wave of glee all throughout the North, because keep in mind, this was the Confederate capital. The other big one is going to be uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's siege of Atlanta. Now keep in mind, Atlanta's in the Deep South. And ultimately, when Atlanta fell, this really, I, I like to think of it as the, as, as the icing on Lincoln's re-election cake. Atlanta had been holding on for a long, long time, and the hope for the Confederacy was that if it could just hold on until mid-November, there was a very good chance that Lincoln would not be elected and they could negotiate some sort of settlement, some sort of peace, some sort of independence with the Democrats. The reason that they thought that is because the Democratic Party was campaigning in 1864 on the idea of peace. They used to be referred to as peace Democrats. In other words, if you elect us, we'll end this ghastly war and we'll negotiate some sort of understanding with the Confederacy. Okay, And so when, when Atlanta fell, that was the South's last real good chance of walking away from the struggle with any semblance of independence. The fall of Atlanta was very consequential, not only for Lincoln's re-election, but the war itself. For your notes, the election of 1864 guarantees that the war will be fought to a conclusive end. Abraham Lincoln is re-elected. He's re-elected very convincingly, and his re-election does guarantee that the war would be fought to an end. In a sense, it's over for the South. It's simply a matter of time after that re-election. Back to Sherman. Sherman, as I mentioned before, realized that it was not always as effective to fight the war on the battlefield as it was to fight the southern, uh, the, the southern citizenry. In the aftermath of Atlanta's fall, Sherman cut himself off from both his supply lines as well as his communication networks. You think to yourself, what are you doing here, man? I mean, this is a really bold, very risky thing to do. You can't feed your army. You're, you're, you're essentially running in the blind. It's pretty clear where he's going with this. He is going to raid southern farms and basically live off the land. His thought was to undergo a campaign, in his words, to make Georgia howl, to break the will of the southern citizenry to continue on in the fight. To break the morale of the citizenry, he embarked on what he called his march to the sea. 
For your notes, the March to the Sea is going to be led by William Tecumseh Sherman. It will begin in Atlanta after the fall of Atlanta, and it will end uh, near Christmas Day, 1864. What he did was just burn everything within his path. Um, twisted up railroads so that the trains could not resupply armies, uh, burned farms, burned houses, raided houses. Keep in mind, um, if you're not going to have supply lines, the only way that you have to feed your army is by living off the land, and that really means raiding farms and towns. In short, it's more or less a war of terror. That's what he understands when it comes to the hard war. But understand something else. If you're fighting with Robert E. Lee up in Virginia, but you're from Georgia, that's where your home is, and you get word that this kind of stuff is happening in Georgia, there's a good likelihood that you might desert, run back down to the farm to see if the wife and the kitties are okay. There's a psychological element to Sherman's hard war that doesn't get discussed enough, but ultimately this does exactly what it was designed to do. It breaks the will of the Confederacy, both the military and the civilian Confederacy, to continue on in the fight. The North's morale is at an all-time high, and the South couldn't really be lower after the March to the Sea. Robert E. Lee vowed to fight another day. Um, his cause was lost. It was just that somebody forgot to tell him. The war is going to continue on into 1865. But the South, and Lee's army in particular, is running out of three very critical things. One, food. Um, his armies are starving. Two, supplies. Many of his men are bootless. Yeah, it's Virginia, but it's still Virginia in, in, in February and in, in March. It's still very cold. There's still snow on the ground. And the last thing that they're running out of is men. So the, 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 the exhaustion of uh, food, supplies, and men is going to be critical because, because if you can't resupply your men, you can't feed them, it doesn't matter how many times that you defeat U.S. Grant. He's going to win because it's ultimately a strategy of exhaustion. By April 1865, Lee was not only surrounded by Grant, his supply lines had been cut off, he could clearly tell there was no tangible way out. There was just no way that he could get out from this trap that Grant had him in. And Grant, or excuse me, Lee, confided in some of his top generals that there was nothing left for him to do but to go see General Grant. And that's what you're looking at there, guys, this painting, the meeting at the Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, Appomattox was where the Civil War came to an end. What you're looking at there is Robert E. Lee and U.S. Grant meeting for the first time. Um, they had never met in real life before. They'd only ever heard of each other. And what Lee is doing is he's proctoring his surrender. Keep in mind, U.S. Grant. Unconditional surrender grant. Lee is surrendering unconditionally. Now stop and think about what that means for just a minute. What that means is you could be in prison for the rest of your life. Uh, your citizenship rights could be forever revoked. Um, you could be executed. Keep in mind what the South had been engaged in for the last four plus years um, essentially was treason. You, you had taken up arms against the Union and you lost. It would have been a different story had the South won, but they didn't. Lincoln had had a talk with Grant before Appomattox, and what Lincoln told Grant to do was to send him and send his boys home, and in one final gesture of compassion and empathy, he sent the rations, food, over to Lee's starving armies. And the war was over. It was over. Robert E. Lee is, is not executed, obviously. He's, he's placed under house arrest. Um, put him under house arrest, more or less, for the rest of his life, and, and what, the, what the government does in the aftermath of the war is they, be, they, they begin constructing this massive, massive army graveyard in, in his backyard. And so every day for the rest of his life that Robert E. Lee got up, he'd have to look out into his backyard and know 
uh, that in some way, shape, or form he had contributed, either directly or indirectly, to, to the deaths of those hundreds of thousands of Americans. In fact, there's only one person that we executed for his role in the Civil War. It's ironic in the sense that, on the one hand, Henry Wirtz, the individual we're talking about here, he was Austrian-born. He was not born in the United States. The other thing that is important that you understand is that he, we execute Wirtz not for leading Southern armies or commanding Southern political bodies. We execute him for what you and I would probably call crimes against humanity. Wirtz ran a prison camp in Georgia called Andersonville. And I'm not saying that prison life in the North was any picnic, any walk in the park, but Wirtz actually went out of his way to embellish the suffering, enhance the suffering of his prisoners, withholding food when there was food to go around, withholding medical supplies to really exaggerate the suffering, the preventable suffering of these American prisoners. In the aftermath of the war, he is prosecuted basically as a war criminal. He's found guilty and he's sentenced to die. Um, what I'm about to show you is graphic. On the one hand, it is the, uh, the scene of the execution of Henry Wirtz. And on the other hand, the, the minute that I click the, the next slide here, um, you're going to see very clearly why he was executed. Um, you're looking at a survivor of the Andersonville prison camp on the left. Um, when that camp was liberated in the aftermath of the war, you, you saw um, um, atrocities like the one that you're looking at on the, on the screen there. But um, this is ultimately what is going to cost Henry Wirtz his life. And he's the only man that we, we execute for his role in the Civil War. But the, the war is over, and now we need to get into the rebuilding mode, right? That rebuilding mode is going to be called Reconstruction, and I'm going to spend our final lectures um, talking about it.